I'm Tom Vassell and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I am excited. You know why I'm excited? Because there are so many great games that exist right now to play. There are so many fantastic games and I just can't get them all played and yet I don't mind. It's like jumping into a pile of games and everywhere you look they're exciting and they're fun to play. And you can't play them all but who cares? It's like going to a buffet with all this food. It's great and fantastic. And you try a little bit of everything, and some of it might not be as good as the rest, but some of it is absolutely amazing. And it's just fun. It's fun to be in this middle of this storm of gaming. And I know that sometimes we come across as negative on this fact, like, oh, you know, there's so many games. And I don't want to ever, you know, let that be the general attitude. It's, oh, there is a lot of games, but we get to play so many of them. We can't play them all. No FOMO here. We're just glad to play some of the games. So we hope to talk about some of these great games and point them out to you. Don't forget that in a week and one day, Dice Tower West registration is going live. Now, just a few weeks from now is Dice Tower Retreat, sponsored by Restoration Games, uh, which is a small, intimate gathering. You might, if you email us, have a chance to get into that, but that's pretty much finished and ready to go, and we're excited about that. But Dice Tower West is in Vegas. It's coming up in early 2020. You can see the dates on the website, DiceTowerWest.com, and we're just really excited about checking that out, uh, seeing how that works. It's, it's going to be bigger and better than last year, and the library is going to be stupendous. We're working on that. This week, we've been working on the library so much, and next week, we'll be working on the library. There's a lot of effort going into that. So that's the things that are coming out in the future. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's coming up from the Dice Tower this week. We got uh, videos coming out, uh, reviews, all kinds of sorts of things. But for now, let's see what I found on the internet. Okay, first of all, there's a new blog called No One Asked For This. <laughs> there was a, uh, the person who did this blog did a top 100 that no one asked for on Reddit. Uh, and now they're doing a blog no one asked for. I like, I like to see new and fresh voices in the hobby, so you can check that out. Now, with no disrespect to the fantastic painters that are on the Dice Tower, um, the, one of the best painters in existence is Sarastro. Now, if you've not seen his work, you should check out his channel. He's a fantastic painter and shows you step by step how to paint different board games and miniature games. There's been a few games over the past year about Castells, the human towers that are built, and it's a fascinating thing. Someone sent me a link for a documentary where you can see how these actually work. So that I found that to be kind of fascinating. Nightwatch Games, one of the best game stores in America. Uh, they've won Gamma Retailer Awards and such. They posted a video showing off their store. You want to see a great local store, check that out. Last week I talked a little bit about Monopoly, and I read on the same channel, actually, uh, MeepleMountain.com, there's an article about Monopoly and me, and it's a really heartfelt thing to read, and I really enjoyed it. Check it out. Game Night from Board Game Geek does playthroughs a lot, and one of the ones they just did was 1830. I mention this because you likely won't see this on our channel, at least from us, but Ambi from Dice Tower and Toby were there, and so if you want to see what an 18xx game looks like to be played, there you have it. I found a post on Reddit called How to Teach Board Games. Everyone's going to tell you how to teach differently, but this was very close to the way that I would teach a board game. I thought it was well written, and so if you're saying, ah, oh, man, how do I teach these games? There's some good tips in that article. Nathan McNair from Pandasaurus Games wrote a fairly lengthy but very interesting article um, on his new Business of Board Games blog about tariffs. Now, of course, tariffs, there's going to be certainly uh, opinions on both sides of the matter, but this one I thought was very well written. Um, it, it shows a lot of stuff behind the curtain about the cost of board games and how tariffs affect that, etc. So if you're interested in the subject at all, you should certainly read it. Uh, there was a funny uh, Q&A question on uh, Reddit, basically, putting chits back into the cutouts. There was a guy who talked about his friend who, when he's done with the game, puts the chits back into the sprues. And does anyone else do this? And surprisingly, other people also do it. I don't know that I would ever do this, but I understand why people might. Uh, 
of Fantasy Flight Games has a live play of Marvel Champions the Game. So if you want to see how this new living card game works, that's on their channel. Uh, I found this Ula Foley art. Um, there's a, a art picture, and you can see it in the links, of one of the folks who works at Fantasy Flight Games. One of the things, if you never heard about it there, is when you've worked there for five years, they commission someone to draw you and put you in one of the games. I've certainly... There are sometimes when I play a game, I'm like, that looks familiar. And I know that person. They're an employee of uh, Fantasy Flight Games. It's a cool thing that they do. And you can see the cool artwork. And then on Board Game Geek, there's a, a, I guess, funny list about getting into board games. Here's what you need. But it talks about all the extra stuff. This game only cost me $30. And then I spent $80 enhancing it. I have to admit, that kind of gets me a little bit where I live. Because I do like to enhance my games. Anyhow... That's what I found on the internet this week. The links for all that stuff is below in the description. If you find something you think I should highlight on the channel, send it to Tom at Dicetower.com. It's your turn. Ooh. Hey guys, I'm Randy. I'm Alan. Welcome to We Game Together. We're actually recording this video at our, at our vacation spot in Iron River. And it's beautiful, as you can see. If there's a random mower... A random shake a because random we're on a shaky dock. Wave. It's from <laughs> the boats that keep coming by here. So what, do they think what you get on vacation or something? What you get is what you got. Okay? That's what I always say. Anyways, You're talking about Black Angel, which was our second purchase at Gen Con, I believe. Yes. Right? That was our second and official purchase. Of all the games that we bought at Gen Con, so far it's my favorite. Absolutely. We've played all of the ones we got at Gen Con except for Merlin, mm -hmm. which I'm super excited about. But Black Angel, Same. very. Very good. I really, really, really good. wanted to play. I wanted to play that game so bad that I actually read the rules in the car on the way here, yes. which I obtained zero of it. So then he had well, to read it. A couple it. of tidbits that you retained. <laughs> I had like two so things good. I remembered. The game is so good. It's very. I think it's very complex. There is a lot yeah. there. There is a lot there. Yep. It was a brain burner. Um, Quite unique of a game. Very. I was actually pretty surprised. Um, it has this like mechanic where. The Black Angel is the ship that's in the middle. As mm -hmm. it's advancing forward, things drop off the, the board. And then so they go to the beginning. So yeah. if you plant like these mission cards and stuff, sometimes they'll give you points or things that will, after it falls off the back, gives you you know, the status effects once they fall off. Right. Otherwise, there's things that you're trying to complete the missions as mm -hmm. much as you can to turn in like, you know, one thing to another. You know, For instance, what are those called? The resources? Like resources. <laughs> into <laughs> I know what into that points and things like that. <laughs> So very mm, neat there. And then you have so your own unique. little player board that has like a grid the thing. Grid, I love and the you're grid. trying to push stuff off your grid even so that they score points later for yeah. the advanced technologies. Lots of really stuff. Of course my favorite stuff. part is the resources are like these really pretty little diamond gems. Right. And then you have these little tiny robots that fit in the spaceships, which yeah, is they, just like, doing that, like just putting them in there. Like so flying cute. through space. And we we made a noise every time. <laughs> it was so nice. Really neat. It is a brain love burner. It. It's a Pretty hefty game, but it, I definitely, yeah. definitely recommend this one. One of the best games I've played in a long time. It's so good. I mean, I've played a lot of good games, but this one's like way the heck up It's real good. Yeah, we loved it. Um, probably don't have a picture of the day for you because we're probably up north. Not. This is your picture, right? This is your picture. Dang this it. Is your picture. Enjoy it. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys next Bye. time. So, what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, I'm going to be showing off the new Century Golems Eastern Wonders. Sam and I are going to do a Miami Dice look at Wakanda forever. And we're also going to be, including Z, and we'll be taking a look at Foodies. You're also going to see our first impressions of Clank Legacy going up later this week. I'll also be taking a look at Brook City and Mental Blocks and the expansion for Stockpile and Inuit. There's a lot of cool games I'll be taking a look at. We're doing our top 10 tiny games. Um, so if you want to see little games that we think are fantastic... Come check us out this week. There's lots of live stuff, of course. Board Game Breakfast. We'll be going over uh, the Kickstarters on our crowd surfing segment on Wednesday. We do live stuff. We try to schedule it around the same time each week. So come check all that out. And, of course, if you miss it, go back. We've also started... There's a couple things. We now have an overhead camera for our live plays, which is going to help out a lot. And our testing Tuesdays, which is usually just a whole pile of games that are, get played in a row, we're going to be splicing them up and putting out them a little bit at a time, the single games. In case you miss it, you're like, did they ever play foodies? Well, yes, now you can see the foodies thing. So I know it's duplicate um, work, but we're going to be eventually deleting the testing Tuesdays uh, from the channel 
because they're kind of there as a live thing. But then later on, if you want to go back and watch a specific game, and hopefully that will help everyone. Of course, the Dice Tower podcast is going up this week, where Eric and I talk about our top 10 games for seven players. And of course, all the other podcasts on the Dice Tower Network channel. And you can find all at DiceTowerNetwork.com. This is Roy Candy, and this is Printed Pieces, where we talk about 3D printing and what it can bring to the board game hobby. So I have War of the Rings set up here because I thought it'd be really cool. I saw a post online where someone had said they had made a Lord of the Rings dice bowl out of the one ring. So I found the files on Thingiverse and they're just there. If you type in dice bowl, it's like one of the first things that pops up. And I printed out a one ring dice bowl to add to my War of the Ring game. Not necessarily in the box, but it'll be cool for my game room. And of course you can roll the dice in there hopefully a little bit more strategically and that way you can have a thing to roll your dice in and have it that's very thematic. I would like to paint mine up gold and um, painting with the PLA plastic I would just normally like prime it and stuff and then you can paint it whatever you want. We'll see if I can make something of that but there's all sorts of like dice towers and dice bowls and things like that that you can print out with a 3D printer. If you check on Thingiverse and search dice tower or dice bowls you can find a whole bunch of different things um, they can use. Some have like hinges and doors and things and, and, and are collapsible some like even use like a coke bottle with like a winding staircase where you use that as the outside so it's sort of like translucent so you can see through it as the dice fall down. Lots of really cool things out there that you can 3D print. So if you're looking for a dice tower or dice bowl or something like that that you'd like to 3D print yourself or try to find a way to get it 3D printed out there then make sure to check out Thingiverse for that. Well this has been Printed Pieces. Let me know in the comments below if you're interested in 3D printing or what you've been 3D printing on your 3D printer and what you'd like to learn about 3D printing. Well, thanks so much for joining me on Printed Pieces and I'll see you on the next one. Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. Just recently back from Gen Con and what an amazing experience that was. If I had the pleasure of meeting you anywhere on the convention floor or at the Dice Tower booth, thank you so much for taking the time to come up and say hello. It really was a pleasure getting to meet so many of you. Well, let's listen to this list. Black Angel, Vindication, Cloud Spire, Horrified, Sierra West, Parks, Cartographers, Arkham Horror, Final Hour. What is this a list of? The hottest games of the convention? Well. Maybe, but it was also a list of games that I brought back that all have dedicated solo modes. And so, if you needed any more proof that many of the biggest games of the year that are coming out have solo modes, there's evidence for you right there. And I can't wait to talk about some of these games. I've played some, I haven't played others yet, but I look forward to talking about some of these games on segments here and on my own channel. So if any of those have interest for you, keep your ears and eyes open because anymore the hottest games of the year oftentimes have solo mode so thank you so much for your time as always and have a great day folks you will not believe the number of games added to the library this week so we need to get started first of all we have the expansion for villainous or standalone game with uh, lots of people inside it and then from gigamic we have contour a little game here then we have forbidden island this is for our children's library then we have go nuts for donuts this is uh another one for the kids library along with tiki topple a mensa select winner Hex Hex. This is a kind of a take that game uh, from uh, Smirk and Dagger. And then we got some uh, abstract strategy games from Gigamic. We got Pylos. These are great games to have in the library because they look fantastic and they're fun abstracts. Quick So, uh, Corridor, and Squadro. But that's not it. You think we're done with those? We still have Quattro. So that's a lot of fun. All right. Then from Gray Fox Games, we're adding the new Run, Fight, and Die Reloaded game in. The Cartographers Roll and Write or Flip and Write style game. Catacombs Conquest, a fun player versus player. For a kid's library, we have Sherlock Express. We have What to Wear. And then everyone, families will enjoy Mice and Mystics. This is a classic game for the library. From Plat Hat Games, also Crystal Clans, this two versus two game. That's only one of two versus two games. We also have Ashes, which completes a trilogy with Summoner Wars. I already have Champions of Midgard, but that's a popular enough game. We want a second copy. This is one without the expansion. Um, then we have uh, Biotics. 
from Smirk and Dagger Games. We have Black Angel, or sorry, Death Angel, the card game. This is a, a rarer game. I'm glad to put this one in the library. And Twice as Clever, which is not actually twice as good as the first game, but hey. In a Pickle for our kids' library, fun party game, as well as Trash Pandas from Game Right Games, Sleeping Queens from Game Right Games, and Slamwich from Game Right Games. You think we're done from Game Right Games? Nope. We also have loot. These are all for kids. Back to rolling rights. Harvest Dice is here. And now, folks, it's about to get epic. We have Tiny Epic Mechs. We have Tiny Epic Kingdoms Heroes Call. We have Tiny Epic Zombies. We have Tiny Epic Kingdoms. We have Tiny Epic Western. Tiny Epic Galaxies Beyond the Black. Tiny Epic Galaxies. And Tiny Epic Defenders The Dark War. Whew. A lot of tiny epicness going on there. From Devere, we have Dungeon Raiders. And one, two, three for our kids' library. Holmes, Sherlock, and Mycroft, as well as Silk. And then we have Forbidden Desert for our kids' library. Then this is one I needed to get in the library. Manhattan Project Energy Empire. So glad that's there. For our kids' library, it's time for a picnic. Back to regular library, Rising 5 from Gray Fox Games, and Fan Hunter Urban Warfare from Devere. Of course, we gotta add the newest genius game, Periodic, what a great game. For the kids' library, The Color Monster. And from AEG, Istanbul, the big box version of it. We're still not done, folks. Now we're adding the gigantic Endeavor Age of Sail. And then this is an older game I hunted down because I know a lot of people like it. And that's Navigador from Mac Gertz. For a kids library, we have Guju Guju. We have Nut So Fast. We have Ratatat Roll. And then for the adult library, we have Welcome To. We've already added Welcome To to the library, but now it has all the expansions. Nevermore from Smirk and Dagger is being added to the library. To the kids' library, the wonderful game Outfoxed. And for the adults, we have Ishtar Gardens of Babylon, a new game from Yellow reviewed by Z last week. Alrighty, from Devere, we have Michael Strogoff. We have the wonderfully new, cool Ecos First Continent from AEG. The classic shipyard game from CGE. The expansion to Everdale. Everdell Pearl Brook and Barcelona the Rose of Fire. Whew, are we done? Not quite. More are coming this way. We're adding filler to the library. We're adding Deckscape the Fate of London and Deckscape Test of Time and Deckscape the Curse of the Sphinx and Deckscape the Mystery of El Dorado and Deckscape Heist in Venice and Deckscape Behind the Curtain and Walking in Burano. And we're almost done. Just three more games besides all those deckscapes, which are fantastic. But we got the Funko Pop, which is two boxes. And then finally, Everdell itself, a game we needed to put in the library. No, we're not done. How about 16 more games? All the pack of games. The whole collection of them going into the library. Whew. Well, that was a lot, folks. That's what we're adding to the library this week. Folks, my name is Annie. Welcome to Portable Gaming, the show about games which are fun to play in pubs and cafes. So today I want to talk to you about what I'm calling the tools of the trade, which are the things I think make playing games out and about a lot easier. So the first thing I want to talk about is the humble game mat. So I normally have two game mats that I carry around. This is an old sort of Magic the Gathering one that I got years ago at a tournament. And this is an Ultimate Guard one, which is my preferred mat. Um, simple piece of neoprene, keeps your games off the table. The table's not in good condition. Makes it easier to move and play components on. Uh, not necessary, but I always think it's nice, especially if you're going out buying games to play in the real world. It means any brand new game almost has something to be protected with. Next thing is a deck box. And uh, this is an Ultra Pro deck box. I've also found a lot of good usage out of the Ultimate Guard deck boxes, which come with a little divider, which I like. Uh, but these are like the, the base standard. If your deck box is worse than this, you've got a terrible deck box. These are excellent. Um, hold so many cards. Keep them nice and protected. Most card game boxes are not designed to carry cards around. They're designed to get them to your house, and that's about it. Next is the Humble Card Sleeve. So I've used card sleeves on most of my cards since I started gaming, and they keep your card games protected. If you don't have a mat, you can play them on most tables without worrying about water damage or anything. Uh, I used a lot of Ultra Pro in my time, but I'm now moving into Paladin sleeves, which I really like, primarily because I can buy them in bulk. Essentials. The next ones, I would say these are kind of bonus ones. Component tubs. Now you can buy specialist component tubs, but these 
I literally got as a Tupperware container from a supermarket for carrying components on, making sure I don't get knocked off tables too easily. And one of these can be nice. It's one of those foldable and collapsible dice trays. Now I got this for a couple of quid off Amazon, but you can get them from loads of cool craft guys. It's great, get some dice, roll those in. I should have really brought some and make it fold down nice and flat. It can be put between boxes and things as you carry them about. Bit of a luxury item. Sometimes you can use the lid of a box, but it is very nice. Anyway, that's some accessories. What kind of accessories do you guys use? Let me know in the comments below and thanks very much. I've been Andy and it's your round. Hi everyone, I'm Doug Jr. and this is a Fellowship of Meeples with Doug and Doug Gaming. Basically last week though, we started talking about some small things that can make a big difference in your games. Uh, basically, I compared a couple of different kinds of shuffles. Well, today we're gonna talk about how you deal the cards and does that make a difference? Well, to test my theories on this, I have invented a little game called The Person with the Most Victory Points Wins. I know it's a brilliant title and it's a brilliant game, but it uses an ordinary pack of playing cards. And the face cards in this deck are going to represent victory points, while the number cards, including the ace, are going to represent ordinary cards. This deck of regular cards has been shuffled thoroughly. I will now deal out these cards to each of our five players using the typical clockwise motion dealing one card at a time. So this has resulted in a tie between player number two and player number four. Since I wrote down the order of our shuffled deck, I can then reset the cards to the original random order. This time, I'll deal all five cards to player number one, then all five cards to player number two, and so on. So this resulted in player number two being the sole winner this time. We'll try again dealing one card per player at a time, but before I do, I'll cut the deck. This time, player number three and player number five tie. So as you can see, a small detail can totally change the outcome of the game. Now, how important is this to your game? Does anybody care? Am I making a mountain out of a molehill? Well, leave me your comments and let me know what you think. But if you're interested, you can check out our YouTube channel at Doug and Doug Gaming for a little deeper discussion on some of these topics. Well, that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on A Fellowship of Meeples. So this past week, I had one of my wisdom teeth pulled, which means I'm getting smarter, uh, or less smart. Oh, mm. anyhow, uh, after you get the wisdom teeth pulled, uh, I thought they were going to knock me out for it. They didn't. Instead, they made me feel a little bit loopy. I was going to have my daughter record a video because I thought it'd be funny, but I actually felt pretty good afterwards. But it made me think. The, the night that my tooth was pulled out, I was extremely tired. So I went to bed early. Uh, fairly early. I slept a really long time, like eight hours. Um, and, you know, I, I got a lot of sleep, and then here I am back. The, I'm actually recording this the day after. My tooth is gone. Tiny bit of pain, but not too much. Um, back and ready to go. But it made me think a little bit about sleep and stuff. And I think, you know, at conventions, there's often the 6 2 1 rule that people talk about where they say you need to get six hours of sleep, two meals a day, and a shower. And you can argue over that whether maybe you should be getting three meals a day because that's not a bad thing. And maybe you should be sleeping seven hours or maybe you should take two showers, whatever, it doesn't matter. I do know that at conventions, we tend to push ourselves because, or anywhere, like at a gaming event, you'll tend to push yourselves or what have you because we want to get in as much gaming as possible. You might say, and this is a valid thing, someone will say to me, hey, Tom, you get to play games all the time. A convention is one of the few places I get to play games. So I'm going to stay up later and I'm going to get less sleep there and I'll push my way through it because that's what matters. You know, that's, I, I don't have as much gaming time. And so it's really critical to me. And even on a game night, you know, I'm like, yeah, hey, I'm feeling tired. Maybe I should go home. And someone's like, hey, one more game. Let's do it. But I would like to posit the idea that being tired is not so much a detriment for you when you record, but being tired is a detriment for the people you play against. I don't know that I would like to play a game against a drunk person. I don't know that I would want to play a game against somebody who was on drugs or somebody who was not paying attention and doing something else at the time, right? And I think it's the same way. I don't know that I want to play a game against somebody who is uber tired. 
Because when you're uber tired, you are not as focused. You are sometimes crankier. You are sometimes not paying attention. And all those things, you're like, I can do it. I can do it. And you might. And that's fine. But your presence at the table is negatively affecting other people who may not be tired. There's a lot of talk these days about driving when tired and how that's just as bad as drunk driving. And there's a lot of truth to that. When you're tired and you drive, there's certainly... uh, you can get an accident, and there's a lot of people who have died because they drove when they were exhausted. When you game and you're exhausted, it's certainly not the same thing, okay? I'm not even trying to pretend that it's the same thing, but what I'm saying is when you game when you're exhausted, you are a liability of sorts to the people you game against. They may not have as an enjoyable an experience, and you might say, I'm fine, I'm doing everything that's great, but it may not come across that way. That's something that I've dealt with. I've played... I remember very specifically there was once a convention and I was really tired. I was about to go to bed and people convinced me to play a game of Cosmic Encounter. It was like midnight. And those people were fine. It is what it is. But I remember during the course of that game, I got really upset, angry, just because I was tired. And that happens when I'm tired. I'm like, oh, whatever. I don't care. Or I might play stupidly and make dumb decisions. And then the people who play me aren't having a good game either. So overall... Uh, I think that when we are tired or some other thing, maybe I'm sick, like, oh, I'm feeling sick, but I'm still going to go gaming. Again, you're, you got to think about the other people there. You might say, I'll battle through my sickness, but they may not want to get sick. So you may be like, I can do it. Fantastic. But think about the others at the table. Hey everyone, today on To Paint or Not To Paint, I'm going to take you through Mansions of Madness, second edition. Matt here from The Plastic Canvas and welcome to To Paint or Not To Paint, a series where I quickly take you through a game and then talk about whether I think it's worth spending the time to paint the miniatures in it or not. And today we're taking a look at Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. This is a co-op Cthulhu themed exploration game where players take on the role of paranormal investigators and then depending on the scenario that they've chosen, go into a location and try and get to the bottom of some sort of strange event that's happened. So is this game worth painting? I can't think of a game that is more of a yes than this one. This game is all theme. Gameplay and mechanics wise, it's very, very simple. You have two actions on your turn, and that could be um, investigating the environment, doing a search, a search action, fighting an enemy, something like that. So gameplay and mechanics wise, very, very simple. This game is played for the story that unfolds and the theme that comes out. And the main way the theme comes out in this game is in the artwork. The tiles that are in this game have really, really cool artwork on them. And then you go and put grey plastic figures on them. And they just become a little bit disjointed and a bit removed from that theme. But painting them um, it just really helps to immerse them in the theme. And even doing a little bit of basing. Um, I did some very, very simple things with mine. Just on the black... Uh, plastic bases that come with the game and that just really really helps to immerse them so considering that this game is really played for the story and the theme anything that you can do to help bring that out is a no-brainer for me so if you want to see the full review for this game check out the dice tower review and if you'd like to see me painting some minis including the ones that you can see here and other ones from mansions as well check out my channel the plastic canvas and I hope you enjoy your breakfast And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks so much for watching. Like I said, lots of different things going on on the channel this week. We'll see you there. Thank you for everybody who sends in nice, kind words. Thank you for people who send in links for the What Tom Finds in the Internet. If you say, where's the news? You don't ever show the news. We do it. But it's on Thursdays, two different ways. You can watch our live Board Game Breakfast for our deep thoughts on the news. Well, as much as they might be. Or I also put up a Dice Tower Digest each Thursday that tells you a short summary of the news that comes out the prior week. Alrighty, games to talk about, people to play games with. I'll see you next time. I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.